Welcome back, Visions fans. Ready Player Will here. Today we're reviewing Locke, one of the new characters and part of the Final Fantasy VI collaboration. Really interesting character that I have a lot of great things to say about. Probably not a lot that you haven't already heard, though, but I'll do my best to kind of give my spin on it, hopefully provide some insight you haven't heard yet, and let's kick things off. So today's presentation is going to be the general character overview, the report card, and stat analysis. My general thoughts kind of encapsulating a whole bunch of different things about uh, the character and, and where I'm going to take the analysis throughout the presentation. Then I'm going to go through the class and job overview, talking about his abilities, which ones I think have relative strength and value, and then go through the notable vision cards, the notable espers, in particular looking at the glacial esper, which is an MR rated esper, which a lot of people have slept on, but I want to bring some attention to it. And then going over the notable weapons and then some trust stone recommendations at the very end. Getting further into things here, the character overview, so brand new light unit, brand new job as well. The treasure hunter is unique to him while also having the pugilist and nightblade sub job. He equips daggers and hat cloths and accessory with a move of three and a jump of three. So he actually has some interesting movement there. In terms of the resistances, minus 10% to dark, no surprise there. His other resistances though, overall pretty strong. The only negatives are the 10% to strike, which isn't a real big fear, if you will, and minus 5% to magic. But the others, 15% strong to missile is fantastic, 10% to slash is great, and then flat to pierce, which is totally fine. And for the resistance ailments, it's a little more niche. I do like that he has the poison there. We're obviously seeing poison as a much more common status ailment. You will probably have him at 50 faith. I wouldn't go any higher than that for any reason. But uh, also 50% to charm, which does have some future implications when Sadali comes out. A little more niche as an ailment, but overall okay, and 10% to sleep, which actually isn't that bad when you consider that Celeste does have sleep access on demand on her cheapest AP ability, so when you do kind of get into that matchup eventually, that actually might come to help him. Well, we're getting to the DPS report card here now, so effective HP, again, high level definition of that is their hit points, but it's adjusted for the resistances, defense, spirit, things of that nature, so that it's more an indication of how much damage you have to do as opposed to just what the actual health point number is. And so for effective HP, is actually a B, and effective HP is a little harder to quantify for evasion units because if they're super evade and you can't hit them most of the time, it really doesn't matter what their HP is because it's almost infinite since you can't hit. But uh, it, it is underrated, the effective HP here, because of the light vision cards for AoE and unit resistance that quite often get put into the parties that he's going to seem more survivable than his health pool should really indicate. Uh, but compared to the other evade units, he's right about where Elena is. So if you're thinking about how hard it is to, like, kill Elena, he's roughly in that same ballpark. Uh, from a physical perspective, it's about the same. He does skew more, a little more physical because he does have six defense innately, but the magic, it's about the same. Uh, although it's minus 5% to the actual magic itself, it, it's all relatively uh, the same. Again, minus 5% isn't terribly material. Now, from a primary stat perspective, so his attack uh, stat, it's actually fantastic. He is an A among some of the tops in the game, quite honestly, when it comes to attack stat, that without passives, he's at 591. And if you're looking across the board at some of the other evasion style units, He's right around where Venera is, and although she's not necessarily known for how hard she hits, with the increase in slash resistance and missile resistance, uh, Locke obviously still has a bunch of passives and a lot of great vision cards that's going to amplify his damage, but his overall primary stat's definitely among some of the best in the game, even the evade units aside, just general attackers. When we look at agility, he's an A-. Uh, if you just have his regular agility, he's definitely an A tier. He's got a passive that increases that agility even further, though, and when you do, he becomes S tier, some of the top fastest characters in the game so very very agile unit from an accuracy perspective because he does have a lot of luck since he's an evasion unit uh, he is an a for accuracy and he has even potential to get it even higher where uh, the way you want to think of it is without his passives his base accuracy is 174 percent go with me here and if you compare that to the average ur which is an average of 161 percent it means he's about 13 percent higher uh, on the hit rate chance than your average ur unit if you equip his nightblade passive which is 25 percent accuracy that bumps him up to a basically 200 percent accuracy which is 40 percent more accurate than the average uh ur and does put him amongst the top most accurate characters in the game so with that nightblade passive really elevates him now i can't say you're going to use it all that often but it's definitely there and a definite option so i can see cases where he becomes hyper accurate because of it we talk about evasion also an a tier unit i mean i use the term s tier but the grade is an a he's among some of the best in what you can find for evasion and then for movement i'm also giving him an a obviously the jump of three it really what 
puts him there, but he also does have a passive that increases his move as well. So tons of flexibility for how you want to make him potentially move. Almost too much to some degree, where sometimes evade units get into trouble where they can just speed right ahead and uh, get ahead of their team too quickly and put themselves in danger. But overall, movement is an A. From a passive perspective, also an A. He's got such a great variety of passives that will completely alter the change of the build, quite honestly, that is great for a bunch of different kinds of content. So we'll get into that soon. The counter abilities is an A+. Plus. It's it's He's got general reflex for both physical and magic, so you can't get any better than that. One of the best counter abilities in the game. The overall kit, I'm giving him an A in terms of the abilities, what he has to offer, the flexibility of the sub-jobs. For a total final grade of an A+, plus, this is an absolutely stellar character. Props to Gumi for giving him out for free. Obviously, you still have to spend to get his shards, and obviously you need to kind of spend in general in the light cast to really be able to utilize the light meta. So it's, it's not without the rest of the light cast that he's, you know, this good. But he's still an A-plus on his own. Absolutely fantastic. We're going to get to my general thoughts here, where obviously, as we mentioned, an S-tier evade character among some of the best in the game. He has an extremely self-sufficient kit, where he does have an ability that bumps his own self-evasion up another 25%. He's got a self-AP restore that will give himself 15 AP. It's a, an AoE ability. And then he's got the re-raise as well. So some characters really rely on teammate buffs to kind of make up for their weaknesses or to kind of increase their overall strength. But his buffs and what he brings to the table, he's pretty self-sufficient in that regard. Uh, and I honestly have this in quotations here. He's a weird blend of utility and strength. Uh, he's 90 cost. I feel like he could be 100 cost with how good some of these, you know, how good some of the utility is compared to his strength. It's really kind of staggering. Uh, hopefully, in hindsight, some of you can see when I looked at Cetia as a 100 cost unit, and then I look at Locke, and I'm like, there's, there's like an obvious imbalance of value here. And so when I say weird, it's he's got a very high attack stat. And so typically, if you're that high in attack, that's typically what you're known for. They don't give you a lot of other utility if, if that's your strength. But he does have high attack. He does have strike damage as a sub job. And obviously, there's some external slash resistance penetration from the light vision cards that increases slash damage overall. We'll get to more of that soon. He does have a physical barrier break. He does have decreased AP 15% to AoE uh, to targets in a cross shape. He can dispel buffs and haste to an enemy. He does have on his sub job for the treasure hunter a decreased CT and slow effect potentially. And then he's got a 38% slash and peril on his limit break. So there's a ton of, of the overall utility with like actual offensive firepower as well, which you don't often see in an evade unit. It's usually kind of one way or the other. Uh, oh, and he, on the Nightblade, uh, has an increased Pierce and Missile Resistance. Now, not an ability you use quite frequently, but it's there. You can use it, so that's that's still something to put in your cap. The rest of the general thoughts, he, is, uh, he has a fantastic blend of passives for differing builds. One of the best things you can ask for in a character, it allows you to use them in a variety of content, and probably use them in a variety of different metas as well, where they're not just like one straight character build overall and he does have superb pve potential as well where again kind of what we saw on the left side here the slash and peril he's got decreased ct and slow he can dispel buffs and haste he's got physical barrier breaks there's a lot of chaining potential obviously with the light cast so overall really great for potential pve when it comes to all that kind of content uh and not many glaring weaknesses to be honest that magic minus five percent and no spirit that's probably the best way you can probably attack him is to go for like high accuracy magic characters because the rest of it there isn't really any glaring weakness overall and on that note of like potentially trying to counter him, I do think there's some interesting counterplay with the Dark Element where a couple of them, uh, Golbez and Dwayne in particular, have re-raise remove, which is a big part of his survivability. Now, obviously, the Dark is not known as the most accurate set of characters. It takes a lot of external investment to make them accurate enough to even hit him. Not impossible, but it's definitely a specific kind of build. But then you talk about the other like Dark and Perils, they can kind of match them for agility. Because he's weak to magic and, and has that no spirit that Black Rosalina and Golbez are kind of like prime, you know, magic users to potentially take advantage of that. And obviously will work really well against Engelbert as well. So it's a little more of a coin toss. It's obviously going to be extremely map dependent because Dark functions best on smaller maps, whereas Light does do better on longer maps where they can get more of their buffs in and their self-sustain. But I think there's some interesting counterplay to be had there. And then, although he does lack inherent slash resistance penetration, uh, there's a lot of ways you could potentially still increase his damage externally, where Scions of Twilight is slash resistance penetration, the Flash of Insight Vision card, both of those are light-oriented, have slash resistance penetration, and although he has one passive that gives him 40 defense penetration, if you didn't want to equip that, you still can increase his defense penetration as well via either the Black Garb or Lock Stagger. They won't stack together, but you can pick one or the other, and then the Trust Don't Set ability, you can actually have the offensive right side be 10 
defense penetration as well. So when you're talking about increasing his overall DPS, you can get the slash resistance penetration externally pretty easily, and you can forego the defense penetration passive for some of this, or you can stack it. We're going to talk about that right now. So in terms of the passives, Treasure Hunter Secret is obviously great. That extra 12% agility puts him to the top of the game in terms of, you know, base agility, if you will. The move plus one can be great as well, too. It just depends whether or not he moves too far ahead. Maybe it actually puts him in range of buffing a teammate. A lot of versatility there. To me, Flurry Enhancement's really only good if you need the extra 20 accuracy. Otherwise, you can obviously trade it off with the Nightblade Master here as well, which is the accuracy of 25. So you have two ways, or you can put them together. I don't know if I'd recommend that, but, you you know, obviously different ways to build it. You do get the decrease of evasion rate of 10% when you do equip the Nightblade Mastery, but you can obviously make up for that in other ways potentially, while still getting the accuracy and 30% attack, which is really going to help his attack stat uh, reach even higher levels here. So a lot of variety to build that. The Mysteries of the Dagger is also really good one where increase evasion rate of 12 again you're talking about different variety of builds playing with the percentages you can go super hyper evade you can go average evade you can go just general evade but here this is obviously a dps increase for high defense enemies of 40 percent but even if you don't want to equip this, there are other ways to get access to it as we went over, so not a game changer. And then Warrior's Spirit overall is a great one too, where you're talking about HP of 12% and attack with 24%. That attack stat obviously going to make him hit harder, and the HP is going to just help him live a little longer, which he already does pretty decently anyway, given the re-raise and the resistances and the evasion and the AoE and, and unit resistance from the vision card. So warrior spirit almost puts him over to the top uh so really a great variety of passives that you can build him in a variety of different ways that will have pretty big ramifications on how the battle ends up turning out when we talk about the counter abilities you're never going to equip flurry counter don't even worry about that one counter swing neither instantaneous perception is like a must-have all the time 15 percent chance to evade all physical or magical uh, attacks always have that on it's absolutely stellar one more reason why he's incredibly hard to kill and when we talk about the main job, sort of the treasure hunter here, we're going to talk about the offensive abilities first and circle back on his buffs. So Rising Sun is the barrier break for 14 AP. That's insanely cheap for a barrier break. 165% is also pretty potent, considering a lot of these AP cost ones are usually in the 121% range. And it's an attack debuff of 43%. That All those th three things in one for 14 AP is pretty nuts. Uh, the AP hunt is another absolutely fantastic ability where... Decent modifier, it's a nice cross shape AoE, it will decrease AP 15% to targets and restore 15 AP to himself. So it's so one of the great things about him that you don't have to have Zizabels specifically, that he does you know get a buffer to win, he'll use this and regenerate some AP. Overall, it's a great way for him to kind of self-sustain without relying on a lot of extra help from teammates or TMRs. Dispel Dagger is another absolutely amazing ability. For 26 AP, you can dispel all buffs or haste to the target, and the modifier of 200% is no joke for something of that cost. So between those three, you have a lot of obviously like utility and some good modifiers there considering the AP costs. For the buffs though, there's some really interesting ones here where Camouflage co Combat, great for the attack buff, increases evasion of 25, definitely a time and place for when you want to use an ability like this. Perhaps if you have the Nightblade Mastery job where you're decreasing the evade by, tw by 10, this is a good way to make up some of that uh, in non-equipment ways. Adventurer's Wisdom is a super, super interesting one where it increases unit resistance of 15 for allies, but it does reduce the chance to counter by 50% for, I believe it's himself and the allies, meaning your counter chance if it was 15% goes to 7%. So there's some trade-offs there in terms of how strong that really is. But the thing that's really unique about this one compared to the others is that it's the only teammate buff. So one, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of the evade characters sometimes get in the habit of just rushing straight ahead. This is one way that if you want to fine tune his AI that you could potentially have him go to a teammate to cast a buff without having to use a TMR ability to do so. So time and place for this one. But again, that versatility is a great thing for the character overall. And Boon of the Phoenix, obviously an absolutely fantastic ability where he grants himself 5% AP auto restore for three turns and gives him the re-raise ability as well so when you're talking about ap management just absolutely off the charts for how self-sustainable he is be between this ability and the ap hunt now when it comes to sub job abilities there's actually some debate how you want to build it there's really no one good way stranded i think is absolutely fantastic for the decrease of ct 50 percent i'm going to see that as a major pve content usage and obviously the, the chance to inflict slow although diminished because he's going to be at 50 faith is something you can play with uh, and then Confuse Edge actually is not bad either, just given that it's a unique kind of style AoE. Again, probably a low chance to actually inflict Confuse. But I think the most interesting thing here is that when you talk about Treasure Hunter, you're going to get into this debate as to which abilities you want to prioritize. 
and this will make sense in a second. The Pugilist sub job, I actually like a lot because if you don't have this on, he's confined to slash type attacks, which obviously you can get slash resistance to penetration relatively easily, so it's not a big deal. But a lot of characters do gear for defense and slash resistance. So by giving him the Pugilist sub job, there's also enough vision cards here that have light attack up as well. I think the other 14 science card does it, that this is still a, a great source of damage where you can do Shifting Strike, Spirit Breaker, Wicked Pummel, all great abilities to potentially enhance his damage. The one trade-off you're going to run into though is if you use these abilities, they're obviously maxed for DPS output, whereas the abilities on his main job are more utility driven. So if you're using the Pugilist, yes, he'll probably do more damage, but that may not be a good thing. You actually might want to make him use his main job abilities, even though they might do slightly less damage. And so that's important because the AI will typically always prioritize the highest damage and abilities. So a lot of times what we've done so far, even in my own guild, is we've kept the Treasure Hunter sub job on, despite the fact that Pugilist probably does more damage because we want to emphasize him using these uh, utility-oriented abilities. Which gets us to the final sub-job here, the Nightblade sub-job. This is also a pretty decent one. I just don't know if it really adds a whole lot that the main job doesn't already do. The AP cost of the abilities is relatively similar. There's not a lot of utility outside of just some of the uh, stun here. The double resist is good, but a little bit niche. But again, a great ability if you want to force him to go to a teammate as opposed to running straight ahead. So some at least some versatility there. It's definitely a great sub-job. Does a lot to increase his stats and his passives, but a little more niche in how you can really tweak this to your advantage. For the limit break, absolutely stellar limit break. This is positively amazing considering it's 43 AP where it not only uh, decreases slash resistance by 38%, which is gonna massively increase his damage as well as Elena's and the other light units by and large, but reduces the counter chance by 100% for the target. And obviously 200% modifier is, is pretty standard for the limit break. For his TMR, it's a stellar TMR. It's absolutely insane how good this is, where it increases agility by up to 20% for teammates and increases luck up to 20% for teammates as well. It's a double cast, which is pretty crazy. And the stats on this, quite frankly, are amazing. Although you're definitely on the lower side of HP for a cloth item, like a piece of armor, if you will, uh, five defense, five spirit, 15 evade. Those are great stats to round him out. And that 15 evade allows you to not have to rely so much on some of the typical evasion gear. And the ability is straight up, it's just like one of the best evasion abilities in the game. So it's just gonna make him and Elena even stronger. And then finally, the mastery ability. Again, we talk about self-sustain. Increase evasion rate of five. It's got the standard HP and light attack. That's no big deal. But decrease AP consumption by 15%. Again, he's got the AP restore. He can steal AP from enemies. And he's got decreased AP consumption by 15%. So overall, he has the ability to just keep spamming some of these abilities that just have a ton of value. And so from that perspective, he's a great damage dealer. Very self-sustainable. Now we get into notable vision cards. My goodness, are there a lot. So I'm going to utilize WOTV Calc again because at this point with the dual vision cards, I could go through like five or ten slides of information. But a couple in particular that I want to highlight, I do think Flash of Insight is probably one of the best ones for him where it increases the slash resistance penetration by 18. It's also got some extra luck on here for his evasion. It's got great stats for a character. And then for the party ability, the obvious 20% evasion rate is great for him and Elena. Increase of attack is great for him. And critical evasion is also great where it just you're not going to get chunked down as often if you take less critical hits. And then another positively amazing vision card here is the Scions of Twilight, where obviously the increase to attack of 10% is big. The Dark Resistance is great for some of those counter matchups. Three Agility makes him even faster than he already is. And then the Slash Resistance Penetration is really a big DPS increase for him, while also having increased HP of 13% of the party, but the Magic Resistance of 20% is also big, because recall his only like legitimate, like commonly used weakness is the Magic of 5%, negative 5%, so being able to turn that to positive 15, again, there's not really many good ways to take him down, he doesn't have any real glaring weaknesses. So this is a definite also thumbs up card for him. And then for MR Vision cards, because there's not a lot of physical oriented vision cards for units, um, you might actually dabble in some of the MR cards. Now, time and place, obviously, but a couple that come to mind, Metal Demon's definitely one where this is going to increase the slash resistance, which you probably see a lot of in the current metas. The slash attack will be a buff as well. The stats, yeah, you're going to lose a little bit and the decrease agility, no big deal, but it's also going to increase the slash attack on the unit ability. I think another decent one is Snow White Guard, believe it or not, where being able to increase his slash resistance and missile resistance here uh, will help him against some of the common metas that we see. The crit damage increase is nice. The AoE resistance obviously will scale down if it's a sub card, but overall, I, this will help his 
uh, effective HP a ton, even though you're decreasing it by 15%. There is kind of a trade-off there by trading the resistances, but obviously a little more niche depending upon what attack types you're going to expect from the enemy. And then finally, Sanctum Assassins is another great one as a subvision card where three agility, obviously that's going to get scaled down, but you're going to get some evasion rate on the unit. You're going to get some unit resistance here, and then you're going to get an extra 10 evasion rate, again, scaled down. It's a subvision card, but I think there's a time and place how you use this as well. So definite options, considering there's not a ton of, like we said, physical attack oriented vision cards otherwise. Now, when we get into espers, at this point in the game, we have four legitimate evasion oriented espers, which quite frankly is going to be what you're going to equip on him 85% of the time. It's either going to be Chaos Odin, Tetrasilphid, Dark Shimra, or Glacial, which is the ice oriented bird that not a lot of people really know about. I mean, it's commonly known, this isn't a big secret per se, but not one that often gets associated with evasion as much as it should. There's obviously a bunch of other great espers you could put on for varying kinds of resistances and modifiers, but that's more unique. I can't speak broadly to those. So I am going to emphasize really just those four. So I have a, a very high level analysis here of uh, exactly what to expect when you equip the four of them. So if we look at the Glacial in particular as a comparison to Chaos Odin and Dark Shimmera, we actually see this a lot on the top end of the game where just earlier this week we saw a ton of top five guilds. We saw VIP doing it where they use Glacial as the esper for lock where if we take a tip a, a random build and this is not like an optimal lock build but it's one that you probably might see relatively commonly where we're going to take lock stagger for the defense penetration we're going to take the ribbon for the evade his own tmr for the buff and the evade i'm going to put the rob card and the science card here for vision cards we got his evasion oriented support skills here and the espers we're going to play with here to see exactly what levels of evasion he gets to with all three and what kind of stats and modifiers you get by using each one. Uh, I also did use just a little bit here, uh, the trust stone. So I used only the set bonus on the left side for the extra luck of 15% because that's what most people will be using at this point. Don't worry about the passives or the stats. I really just wanted it for the 15% luck. And then for teammates, uh, I had an Elena with her vision card and secrets to heart for the extra luck bonuses. And then on, on Angle Bird, I had Bahamut as well as Solidus here. So if we're looking at Chaos Odin in particular, he, if you were to put Chaos Odin in here with what I think are the best nodes, you're gonna get to Agility 99, the, these mods, don't worry about that. But those three inputs will sum up to the total starting evasion rate of 288%. And that number doesn't mean much inherently, but it will when we compare it to the others. So 288% is his total evasion rate with Chaos Odin, who's kind of at this point like the de facto best evade esper for most people in the game. Demon Shimmer, which is the MR dark oriented one, uh, kind of similar stats. You take a decrease in the luck overall just because of the inherent stats on the on the esper and it ends up dropping to a net uh 282 percent evasion rate so you lose six percent evasion going from chaos odin to demon shimmer and again we're only talking about an evasion rate we're going to talk more about the boards in a second and then when you look at glacial when you equip them and give them the 15 percent luck nodes the luck bounces back up to the highest luck out of all the espers for a total evasion rate of 279 percent so if you're talking purely on evasion glacial is roughly similar to demon shimmer i don't th think three percent is all the material it's a definite decrease from chaos odin though where you're talking nine percent less evasion overall but again chaos odin is like a high-end you are esper that not everyone might have yet so if you don't have them that's fine there's obviously great alternatives but what we also want to consider is the other buffs and perks that it gets to the boards that are unique to each of these espers so now that we have the context of evasion in mind if you equip chaos odin you get 15 slash attack 25 human killer uh basically an extra seven percent ap start starting uh, max ap and then three crit evade for a total attack of 1326 so you're getting 288 percent evasion for 1326 attack and a total of 40 on modifiers against like we'll say pvp content where it's all humans so 40 for modifier if you do demon demon shimmer you drop that modifier significantly from 40 down to 15 only 15 slash attack and although yes he does get a little bit extra accuracy here the attack does drop by about 32 total attack now 32 total attack isn't a massive drop uh, but the modifier is definitely a massive drop so it will be a pretty substantial dps loss going from chaos odin down to demon shimmer and that's to be expected chaos odin's a top end Asper Demon Shimmer is a medium limited one. But when we look at Glacial in particular here, so although they end up losing some of the evasion, the modifiers though, you still re retain 15 slash attacks. So that's equal to Demon Shimmer. So definitely still less than Chaos Odin. But the upside is that you do actually still get an extra 10% missile resist, which can be great considering that Sharpshoot is a very common type of guaranteed hit attack. And although 
he still retains 7 accuracy, but that extra luck of 579 will actually also increase his total accuracy. So although you might look at Demon Shimmer and be like, oh, you're getting 12 accuracy, that's more than Glacial. Glacial actually ends up netting more because the luck stat is so much higher. And also to consider, because he also gets 15% attack here as well, his attack goes up significantly. Where if you're comparing Glacial's attack to Demon Shimmer, it's basically an extra 100 it's 90 or so but basically an extra 100 attack stat which is fairly significant so again if you're comparing glacial to demon shimmer they both have 15 on the modifier but glacial has an extra 100 attack stat and more accuracy while only giving up three percent evasion so glacial is actually better which again not everyone really thinks about they everyone gets so hard focused on the 25 evasion of demon shimmer and I, again i just use chaos odin here as the barometer for like what the top is if you will so chaos odin's probably still recommended over glacial in most instances but if you're running elena and lock you probably have chaos odin on elena so glacial is a great second option for lock and then we talk about weapon optimization this is actually very interesting and very fun because daggers by and large are not a, a popular equipment type in the game only a handful of people can use daggers we really only have like one craftable type of dagger uh, that was part of an event but there's a couple that you want to keep in mind so number one because again you always want to play with the evasion here if you're going for the sake uh, going from the perspective of a tmr blood soaked dagger is a relatively good option here where if you were to invest trust stones on this it still has 15 evasion on the dagger so you can keep that 15 evade you can put on an evade piece of armor and this will help round down to seven percent evasion but every little bit ends up adding up the dark killer is really great considering what i was talking earlier with the kind of like dark counterplay where there might be some situations where dark does well against lock but this is obviously going to be extra damage against that type of enemy while still retaining some of the hp and attack overall maybe not the best weapon but the fact that it exists is a very interesting chess piece considering it gives you some flexibility on your other two equipment items to equip accessories and cloth there instead the second dagger to emphasize, as we talked about earlier, was Locke's own dagger. This is one that's really, if you're really, in my opinion, aiming for a higher attack stats where you go for the 170 attack, but it's really for the defense penetration of 20 at the end of the day, that it's supposed to be maximizing his damage output. And that defense penetration, don't forget, will also help his strike attacks as well. So some of these other daggers that we'll see, if they do slash attack up, that's only going to affect the main job and the nightblade sub job. But the third one, the third weapon that is, in my opinion, the best kept secret in the game. No one talks about this item. I've only seen it a handful of times. It's one of the best items in the game, secretly. And for those of you that have not gotten it to this point, good luck. It's going to take you eight months to a year to get it. And that is the main gauche. This weapon is an MR weapon that you can only get through the daily shop. There is no event for this. There is no farmable way to get this. It is literally refreshing your shop three times a day, buying the recipes as they appear. Speaking anecdotally, I have been farming the main gauche for eight months and I still don't have enough recipes for a plus five. I'm close, I'm all about 10 recipes away. So I've been using it as a plus four, but this is a fantastic weapon for evasion when you talk about subbing in potential differences for how you get your evasion where yes slash attack of 15 but the dodge build of this gives you 20 evade i very distinctly remember this early on in the dark meta where vip again they usually find some fantastic creative way to use a, we a weapon or an item that we haven't before they were building their venera with the main gauche and using a real piece of cloth on her instead of an evasion piece of cloth with the idea being, you still get 20 evade as compared to, at the time it was the sage ad, so it was like 29 evade. So you, you do take overall like less potential evasion, but by giving her a, a sturdier piece of cloth, you bulk her up so that essentially you can take more hits. And you can do the same thing for Locke, where if you give him this dagger, 20 evasion, it gives you a lot of flexibility to use other cloth types on him or TMRs where you may not otherwise. So this is a very unique piece of equipment that if you haven't started shopping for, I would make it part of your daily routine to get as many recipes as you can. And then trust on recommendations. There's honestly a lot for Locke because again, he can be built in a variety of different ways. If we're talking the left side, to me, the luck 15% set bonus is like a must for the evasion and the accuracy. Uh, the only other one that I see as a potential one is the evasion rate of 15, where, you know, if you think he's already accurate enough and you really want to max the evasion, it ends up being only about 4 to 6% more evasion. So it's kind of material, but not necessarily. It's really just a trade up which one you want to emphasize. For the right side, though, my goodness, you could like literally go with almost anything. So number one, obviously the attack of 10% and the defense penetration will help increase his overall damage output. I think the accuracy of 15 is another great one where if you're in an evade meta, just which evade team is more accurate than the other can be the game changer. I have seen a lot of people using the Alexandrite ring on their lock where he's already evasion oriented enough that they 
figure, make sure he can hit the other evade units pretty consistently. Nothing wrong with that. This is the same idea. The crit rate, I also think is a really good one where crit rate of 15 and crit damage, obviously light element is known for a lot of extra crit damage potential with the Jaden card and the dexterity up, things of that nature. So I think there's a build for that. And then finally, I just think the agility one obviously straight up can too, that if you're really maxing for the evasion lock, giving them the extra three agility, giving the extra five evasion rate. Overall, any of those four, I think have a time and place. So a lot of variety in how you can build him. But that's the lock review in a nutshell. Again, I'm sure a lot of you already kind of know most of this. So I wanted to touch upon a couple of unique things, but really interesting unit, really great they gave him to us for free. He's going to be a in the game for quite some time now. You're not going to see him go away anytime soon and really pairs extremely well with what the light cast already does. So good luck building him. Good luck using him. Good luck fighting against him. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. I'll talk to you all soon.